guest host, Shelley Hack. Once upon a time, there was a television show starring several wonderful actresses and me, their wonderful boss. It was a groundbreaking detective series, and its stars became some of the most famous angels on Earth. My name is Charlie. And I'm Shelley Hack. Join us as we catch up with some of our favorite stars on Hello Angels Week here on Biography. Is that you, Angel? I'm here, Charlie. Call me Shelley. Right. Well, as you know, Biography has hired us to find out about some of our former angels. Tonight's subject is Jill Monroe. Oh, Farrah Fawcett. Only on the show for one season, but she made quite a splash. I'll say she was quite a phenomenon. Well, you might be interested to know how much Farrah has done since she worked for you, Charlie. She's had a string of critically acclaimed roles on stage and screen. She's also had her share of challenges away from the camera. But Farrah Fawcett's come a long way since her early days as an angel. It's this radiant personality, this radiant smile. Dynamite. This radiant hair. She's everybody's high school sweetheart. What Farrah Fawcett had as an actress, much to my amazement, was a kind of soul. I would say Farrah is as tormented as she is talented. My theory is that she doesn't have terribly good taste in men. She's had a lot of heartaches and heartbreaks. She's just unpredictable as hell. You know, she's just wacky. Farrah Fawcett was an icon of the 1970s. But in the last few years, she's been the target of rumors and tabloid headlines. And in 1998, an incident with a former boyfriend left her beaten and bruised. His very public trial threw her into the spotlight. Farrah Fawcett's life now couldn't have moved further from the way it had all started. In the 1940s, the Texas horizon was dotted with oil wells. Oil was what made Texas run. One handsome young man who worked in the middle of it all was Jim Fawcett. Jim lived with his wife Pauline and their daughter Diane in the coastal city of Corpus Christi. It was 1947 and Pauline was pregnant with a second child. Jim was sure he was about to have a son. The doctor told me it was going to be a boy. And I said, well, that's fine. And I, I told Pauline, I said, well, we'll name him Toby Joe. And she said, no, we won't name him Toby Joe. <laughs> But it was a girl. On February 2nd, 1947, Farrah Lene Fawcett was born. She was named after an old friend of Pauline's in Houston. The first few months of Farrah's life were not easy. When she was just 28 days old, the Fawcetts were told that their daughter had a stomach tumor and would have to undergo life-threatening surgery. The doctors weren't even sure that Farrah would live. She survived, showing a toughness of spirit that would always serve her well. When Farrah was still small, doctors diagnosed her mother, Pauline, with severe anemia. She would need a lot of rest and didn't have the energy to care for a toddler. It became 11-year-old Diane's job to look after her little sister. So at the tender age of two, Farrah began tagging along with her sister every day to Catholic school. After Farrah was born, mother was ill for a number of years. So Farrah was my little, my little girl. And thank goodness we went to a school like, that was a private school because I'd have to take her with me because mother was too sick to take care of her. So Farrah was in school from the time she was two. The nuns at the school were always happy to look after Farrah. With her blonde hair, blue eyes, and big smile, she was quite a charmer. Farrah as a child was so beautiful that she drew attention wherever she went. Her mother couldn't take her out shopping without people commenting on what a beautiful girl she was. But early on, Farrah saw the dark side to getting lots of attention. One day, walking alone on the street, she was attacked by a stranger. She was molested, um, dragged into a cornfield, I believe, in um, Texas. In, um, she was about seven, and she was very disturbed because the guy grabbed her and I think maybe ripped her buttons off of her blouse and she just screamed and ran away from him and uh, it must be frightening to have that kind of attention as a very young girl and then see it turn ugly 
Para would suffer from recurring dreams about this frightening incident well into her 20s. Despite this traumatic experience, she maintained a sunny disposition. Para minded her parents and got good grades at school. As a teenager, she hung out with friends, gossiped about who was dating who, and had slumber parties. At one of them, the girls had a run-in with an intruder, and Farah showed how fearless she now was in the face of danger. We were all kind of frightened, and my first thought was to head back to the bedroom. Farah's first thought was to catch him. So she started after him, and then all of us followed. So here this poor teenage boy was stranded on a fence with four teenage girls in their baby doll pajamas waiting for the police to come. Farrah moved on to W.B. Ray High School in 1962. It was one of the largest high schools in Texas, with no shortage of pretty girls. Yet every year, Farrah Fawcett was voted the most beautiful girl in school. She never had to worry about being alone on a Saturday night. She always more or less had a very charmed existence. She was always somebody who was sought after, popular. She never had to worry about a social life. But Farah's beauty also made her insecure. She began to feel that people didn't take her seriously just because she was pretty. Besides, Farah was no frail beauty. She did things that would make most girls squeamish, like hunting with her dad. She enjoyed hunting, and uh, uh, I guess she was taking uh, biology in school, and... Uh, she would always uh, enjoy dissecting the frogs and the ducks that they killed, you know. <laughs> but uh, she was a good shot. Farrah Fawcett graduated from W.B. Ray High in 1965. When she left home for college, her father told her to work hard. Her mother said, have fun. That fall, Farrah entered the University of Texas at Austin. UT was the university in Texas, a football powerhouse with a sprawling campus. Farrah planned to major in microbiology, but it quickly became apparent that she was the most popular subject among the male student body. When she pledged Delta 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 sorority, fraternity men waited in line for the chance to meet her. Farrah's old friend stood by and watched this spectacle with awe. You just thought she was your friend, and then you start looking around at all the boys just lined up just to look at her. And she had a lot of guys wanting to date her. And sororities will hook up with the fraternity, and they'll have match parties and that kind of stuff. And I know that all the boys were wanting to be matched with Farrah. <laughs> she ended up with dates for breakfast, lunch, and dinner for the rest of her freshman year. That same year, Farrah was voted one of the 10 most beautiful co-eds at the university. Now the word was getting around even outside the campus and the state. In 1966, she got a call from a Hollywood publicist asking her to come to California to work as a model. She was all for it. Her parents felt otherwise. She and I um, were going to go out to Hollywood this summer after our freshman year. And um, we were both surprised when our, both our mothers said, absolutely not. And so uh, Farah stayed home that summer instead, but that was the beginning. But the publicist didn't give up. It got to be an inside joke among Farah's friends. They'd answer the phone, then yell to her, Hollywood's calling. It would take some time, however, before Farah could convince her parents to let her go. In her sophomore year, Farah changed her major from microbiology to art. She decided she'd rather paint and sculpt than dissect frogs. That same year, one of those boys who had stood in line to meet her won Farrah's heart. Not only was he good looking, he was the quarterback of the UT football team, Greg Lott. Farrah lived something of a storybook life, but she was also a free spirit. She danced barefoot at fraternity parties and wore cutoffs to art class. One thing she didn't do was drink or experiment with drugs. She liked to be in control of herself, and so she didn't like to do anything that would uh, facilitate or cause her to lose that control. So we'd all be sitting around maybe doing our drinking or our whatever, and she just, you know, do, she was just Farrah, and just, she had a good time without it. Which is not to say that Farrah wasn't ready to see the world a little. At the end of her junior year, she finally talked her parents into letting her spend the summer in Hollywood, just to see what it had to offer. 
But Mr. and Mrs. Fawcett were not about to send their little girl out on her own. So in July of 1968, the Fawcett family made the trip west to California. They installed Farah at the Hollywood Studio Club, a very un-Hollywood kind of place. Daddy and mother and Farah and a U-Haul <laughs> on the back and took her to Hollywood where she stayed in the women's hotel. And Daddy started to take the bags upstairs and the lady said, no, no men upstairs. <laughs> Mother and Farah had to do it. <laughs> Farah kissed her parents goodbye and settled into her new apartment. She had a whole summer to play at being a starlet before heading back to school. And what could possibly be better than that? You're watching Farah Fawcett, part of Hello Angels Week on Biography.